And uh, this session is kind of the uh, cases that build character. So uh, let's see. We're going to start with a carotid case. The first one is with Dr. Dan Clare, and this is a carotid stenting gone wrong. Thank you, Dan. All right. So uh, I, I should have said before, I really want to thank the organizers for including me in this meeting. It's been a good experience. I've actually, just in that session, learned a great deal. So I actually really appreciate being invited. These are my conflicts. I'm going to start out with a case. Um, and I'm, I'm going to do uh, this a little bit different carotid stent case. So I, I just uh, ask your indulgence. So this was a 69-year-old woman who actually initially presented with left neck pain. But in further discussion, it was discovered that she'd actually been having intermittent episodes of left-sided amaurosis fugax and intermittent problems with speaking that she didn't really think were that important. And she, she got a CTA. And this is going kind of fast, but what you're going to notice is that the origin of her left common carotid is severely diseased. In fact, her carotid bifurcation doesn't really have tremendous disease in it. So she actually had had a carotid duplex, which was not very dramatically abnormal. I tried to show this from a lateral viewpoint, and and I, I wish I could stop this, but there's, uh, there's extensive disease at the origin right here, you'll see, of this, uh, of this left common carotid artery. But there was a lot of concern about the origin, and again, I, I'm sorry I didn't bring a still image, but the origin of that left common carotid artery was severely diseased, and so we were concerned about potentially doing this from an anti-grade approach and decided to do a carotid cut down and just do a retrograde carotid stent uh, with with uh, with TCAR, so we could actually uh, drain off the the, um, the the debris when we were doing this. And this was uh, you can see the Wheatlander uh, retractor in place, and you know this is micropuncture access, and you can see we're in the lumen. Things look pretty good. We advance to an 035 wire, and we uh, insert the sheath and doing angiograms through the sheath, and now you can see this. And this is like one of those things where you're just like, oh my God, what did I, what did I just do, and how am I gonna fix this? And uh, she's got calcification at her origin and, and problems with this. So the first thing I do in a situation like this is I wanna make sure that I'm not in a dissection with the more distal end of what I have in place. So I pass a catheter over this, and just do a quick injection into the aorta. And okay, I look at this and I'm thinking, okay, this looks, looks pretty good. And uh, do an aortogram. I don't see the origin of the common carotid here, so back the catheter up a little bit. Okay, now this still looks pretty good. Now on fluoroscopy, I'm not showing it, but that stain of contrast is still there in the dissection flap. But none of it's filling in you know, either above or below my, my intervention. So we place a covered stent, extend it beyond the origin of the vessel, do this, uh, do this other uh, retrograde injection. She wakes up, she's fine. She's neurologically intact. She has no issues in the hospital. Her incision heals. We follow up with the carotid duplex, and this is the image on her duplex just above the area of the stent. And you can see she's got a dissection flap in the carotid, and you can see a dual channel carotid flow at this point. But neurologically, she's intact. We've maintained her on dual antiplatelet therapy, and I'm not sure we, we did the right thing here or not. Um, you can see on the image on the right a bi, you know, bi-channeled uh, flow. And of course, now she's three or four weeks out from this, and so you know, I'm not about to go back into doing this. Actually, reaccessing to, to intervene from below is going to be difficult. So we monitored her. I put this up just because one of the critical issues we use to assess this is velocities, and her peak systolic velocities in that area are very high. Um, but she actually has pretty well-preserved waveforms beyond that, so we decide to observe her. She comes back uh, a, a year later, 
Um, she still has evidence of a dissection flap that you can see here, but her velocities and her, her flow looks a little bit less turbulent through this region. I'm sorry, I don't have a video clip of that. But more importantly now, her velocities in that, in that carotid are back down into essentially a normal range and we've continued to observe her. I'm gonna do just one other quick case. 70 year old uh, gentleman, uh, about 36 hours after a STEMI, he's got impaired ventricular function, has a mild right-sided stroke at this point. Uh, our cardiology colleagues are really concerned about him as a candidate for a standard open uh, end arterectomy, so we decide to do a TCAR. Uh, this is his, uh, his CTA. The disease at the bifurcation is not as tremendously bad as I would uh, expect to normally see, but by duplex, it's, uh, it's well into the 50 to 69% category by velocities. And um, I'm not gonna waste your time with this. Not good carotid endarterectomy candidate, considered for TCAR. You can see the retractor down here, access, and he's got, you know, at least on this view, probably a 50 to 60% stenosis. Doesn't look that irregular, but he is symptomatic. So we go ahead and treat this with a stent. He has a pretty good angiographic result at the time that we place the stent. Uneventful recover, recovery, recovers from both his cardiac uh, event and his stroke. Uh, and at one year has significantly elevated velocities in this, uh, in this carotid. We get another CTA. And again, I can't really stop this, so I have this, and I didn't get a single image, but what you can tell is that there's a significant amount of abnormality in that right internal carotid in the mid portion of the stent where his narrowing was before. He did actually have an angioplasty at the time of his stent. It's not like we didn't, he didn't have that treated, but uh, this is a little bit slower view. Again, looking at that right side, the internal carotid, you can see the stent, upper end of the stent there. And what you can see is he's got a little infolding and essentially thrombus through that. Because of the nature of that, uh, didn't feel that re-intervention was good because it looked to, to us like there was a fair amount of thrombus within that area of narrowing. So we actually, uh, I'm apologize, he was uh, medically managed initially through the first year, but we, uh, we uh, repeated, uh, we considered repeating an intervention and a surgical repair, and in my view, surgical repair was the best. This is the explant of his stent, and you can see how deformed it is in the middle here, and you can see how narrowed it was. Although it looked like thrombus on the CT, obviously this was, uh, was animal hyperplasia that had plagued this. You don't see that very often. Perhaps we should have been more aggressive about the, the post-stent dilation in this individual. He ultimately went on to do well, but just thought I'd present some kind of different cases of how carotids can go wrong. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Those were great. Uh, let, let me begin, maybe ask you a couple of questions and then we can open it up to the panel. You know, uh, it, what's your decision? I know you were the PI of the Gore, Gore Floor Reversal and obviously you've been doing carotid stenting for a long time. What's your decision making now regarding these three procedures, you know, the transfemoral TCAR and obviously CEA? Can you briefly tell us how do you make a decision as to how you approach? Yeah, so, I mean, within our group there, we have, you know, I, I've, since we have a larger number of surgeons, everybody doing two of these a year doesn't make sense. So I've tried to keep TCAR in the hands of a couple of individuals within our group. I'm probably primarily the person who does the most transfemoral stenting, and the patients I use transfemoral stenting on are usually patients who have recurrent stenosis, uh, which has a pretty low risk, or radiation injury potentially as their primary indication for doing it, because I actually, if you have a low-based radiation, I'm not sure you're saving the person uh, dramatically with TCAR. And for uh, symptomatic lesions, our primary method of therapy is, is end arterectomy, but if they're not good candidates, I think you need some form of flow reversal. I wish we had GORE available, but in this setting now we use, we use TCAR. Okay, thank you so much. And Drew, uh, how about you in regards to 
your approach, you know, can you walk us through your filter choice and stent choice for this crowded stents? You know, do you have a particular device that you use uh, for crowded stenting these days for via the transfemoral? Yeah, so thanks, Mehdi. So, I mean, for us, you know, exact, uh, you know, you got to make sure you're doing the right stuff with the, the AMBO shield. I think the key thing here is that when you talk about transfemoral versus TCAR is that, you know, it's all about your individual, who's got the volume? That's the critical thing. We know that, right? So at, kudos to you for limiting the amount of people that are doing which thing, because I think when it comes to carotids, you got to have the people that are actually doing the right volume. And if it's TCAR, it's TCAR. If it's carotid, it's carotid and it, it, endarterectomy. And um, it also comes down to kind of symptomatic uh, versus asymptomatic and kind of the, the nature of the beast. And I think it's really important in this space that you are a high volume operator. And that's hard to find nowadays. Honestly, it's hard to find. And so I think it's important that we, uh, at every institution, no matter which device, no matter which technique you do, that it's clearly uh, controlled slash you know, mitigated because at the end of the day, if you're a low risk operator doing two a year, patients are not gonna do well. So that, that, that's a good point, you know. We have to do the carotids uh, by high volume operators. So in fact, I lost my privilege because I did not do enough in my hospital. So I have a senior cardiolo interventional cardiologist who does carotids and I told him, look, you have great outcome, I'll let you do it. And uh, he's about to retire, you know. So I told him, you know, when you're about to retire, if there is nobody else, I'll come and get trained from you and then re-privilege at that time. I think that's a great point. Uh, how about you guys, uh, Peter and uh, Chris? Um, yeah, you know, so we, we have the chance here. We're, we're part of both Crest 2 on the stenting arm as well as recently the InspireMD Seaguard trial. And one of the things we implemented there was the same kind of multidisciplinary decision making. Our vascular surgery, interventional cardiology, and neurointerventional teams all work together on it. It's been, it's been such an advance in the field, the, the patient selection, as Dr. Claire was talking about. I mean, there's a pretty rigorous anatomic review committee um, for these cases that are being submitted. And, and when you choose the right cases with appropriate anatomy for femoral stenting, the outcomes start looking really, really good. And, and, but that all comes from the work ahead of time, right? It's not, it's not deploying a stent in the carotid. It's really identifying the optimized patient, especially with more and more options becoming available. Yeah, just a couple quick points. I, I mean, I think it's important to limit the amount of people doing the procedures, but you also have to train the next generation. You know, we had three guys just retire in the past 12 months, and they were pretty high volume. So now we're only left with two carotid operators in a pretty busy practice. Um, TCAR for me is, is limited to people who have really hostile arches, or if they have a super calcified carotid that I want to shockwave. Um, and they're not a surgical candidate. So the vascular surgeon will call me and ask me to come do it with them so that I can shockwave the car. It's nice, you know. it's nice to hear the collaboration, you know, even in the crowd space. I think, you know, this is uh, given the options with the T car and the crowd and the arthrectomy. Any questions from the audience uh, related to crowd uh, intervention, crowd stenting? Yes. Can I ask you a question? What, what are the indications for common carotid stenting, in your opinion? Because many times the surgeons say they are not amenable for revascularization surgically. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I think if you're intervening, well, obviously, obviously symptomatic disease is, uh, is an indication to do something. But if I'm doing an endarterectomy and based on duplex or CT, it looks to me like there's more than a 70% stenosis, which is what I consider hemodynamically significant. I'm going to consider approaching it. Um, I, I will say it's pretty rare right, right now in my experience. It's probably 5 to 10% of patients who have that. Most of the disease is centered at the bifurcation. And I'll also extend my endarterectomy pretty proximally to be able to deal with proximal disease as well. You can get very low on the carotid surgically uh, without extending your incision, you know, without having to do a sternotomy, frankly. Yeah, you know, the, technically, you know, going back to that first case that you showed, you know, those can be challenging, right? Because, you know, you're not able to bring a sheet. So, you know, to, typically we use guides, you know. I mean, one option is what Dr. Claire did, you know, to come retrograde. But the other option is that to use a guide, you know, usually a headhunter or something like that, eight French. And then, you know, you're able to put a filter and try to have enough support so that you're able to place the stent at the ostium. But those osteo, the common carotids, they're calcified and they can be challenging sometimes and 
we don't want to miss the ostium. So, um, uh, Shop, I think you had a question. So I have a um, question in regards to uh, penetration of shockwave in uh, carotid territory. I heard somebody said that they use shockwave in the T cars. Is somebody you start using it from transfemoral approach? Because I have seen a bunch of carotids who are so calcified, and we, the decision is made we're going to go ahead and stent it. But like when we stent it, it's a little expanded sometimes, and then you struggle later on. So somebody start using shockwaves, and what's your take on like you know? Distal embolization and um, yeah, I, if you talk to um, Peter Sukas, he'll tell you it's off the reservation and it's off the reservation. So you're going to have to be very careful and make sure you document why you're doing it. Uh, Peter definitely probably has the most ex expansive uh, experience that I know of in the carotids using shockwave as part of transfemoral. But you got to make certain that you cover uh, is obviously clearly off label and. Uh, Make sure. I mean, he he got a call into the CMO's office when he did it. So, I would be very careful. Uh, I, do I think it's totally reasonable? Yeah, I think it's totally reasonable because it allows expansion. It's just a space that's very very delicate. So I think you got to make certain that you're sitting in good grounds before you use that. Yeah, I mean, I I you know have would have significant reputation. I'll be honest with you, and uh, you know uh, because this is a space that even if you are perfect you still can have uh, significant consequences. So it does make me, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't want to do it. I mean, I think that if I cannot, uh, if it's that calcified, maybe we should do carotid and arterectomy. It has to be a very special situation uh, for me to do it. I know, Chris, you mentioned it. What situation, because we don't want to maybe advocate something that you guys are doing once a year. So uh, what? <laughs> no, it's very specific for me. I never do it with transfemoral. It's only patients who need a carotid endart but can't get it because of surgical risk. In that situation, the surgeon will do that. Will set up for a TCAR and will do it during TCAR with flow reversal. So they have no other no other options. Symptomatic, severely calcified carotid, not a surgical candidate. Flo and you have flow reversal. So that's and the flow key. Reversal. You have flow reversal. So I, I think that Dan, what do you think? Is that reasonable? I think that's probably the only group of patients, and I mean, I, I would imagine that's people with anatomic risks for surgery, including radiation therapy or prior prior surgery. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I'm going to invite the next speaker. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Goodney's flight was canceled last night. He was exchanging emails with us and phones and uh, and text. So we're going to move on to the next presentation: common femoral artery intervention. I'm proud of uh, with Dr. Tapa. Mehdi, thank you very much. And uh, I'm not sure that's the right uh, title for common femoral artery intervention to say I'm proud of, but uh, now and then we can do them and we may be able to get away, but uh, I'll do the quick. So I do have a speaker engagement with that, but that's my... The, what's unique about the common femoral artery, it's usually heavily calcified lesions. It can be challenging and technical success is lower. Patency rates for both short-term and long-term birth endovascular has not been that great. Circumferential calcification increases the risk of flow-limiting dissection and acute vessel recoil after angioplasty is very common. Stenting is not the best option due to risk of sub-expansion, compression, malaposition, fractures, they are all in reality because acutely when you stent, everything looks good. Afterwards, it's trouble. But if somebody has a perforation, rupture, then it's pretty OK. My previous uh, mentor, Abu Rama, used to say, acutely take care of the situation. Later on, we'll see if we need to pull it out. But you do need to have a multidisciplinary approach and uh, have the best options for the patient. Common femoral endarterectomy is always the standard of care. Surgery has some complications, but it's kind of reported from one Medicare registry only by New and et al. However, it's a very low-risk procedure. Endovascular options are good for patients who are obese, high-risk patients for wound infection and comorbidities. Also, the key thing is for junior fellows we teach is respect the profunda. As yesterday, Mehdi was talking about, it's the guard's bypass, or it's like the left main of the leg. 
Acute compromise, remember, can cause hip disarticulation. That's a reality. You're not losing the leg at the below knee or anything like that, especially if you're doing this for a claudic end, be careful, especially if SFA is occluded or if the profunda is the only patent artery, you can really cause harm to the patient. So how do you classify common femoral artery lesions? From cardiology side, we haven't done a good job to classify them, although we do a lot of this uh, revascularization for TAVR procedures. We should come up with a good classification, but this is what I found in the vascular surgery journal. Type 1 is just diffuse disease but may involve external iliac artery. Type 2 is focal 1, which is very rare. Type 3 is more common where it involves both the ostium of the SFA and the profunda and distal common femoral. This is why when surgeons do the endarterectomy, they enter into the common profundoplasty and also leave a small um, patch into the SFA, which makes it easier later on. The type 4 is something that surgically, if there is a bypass from a ileo common femoral, these are the ones which we shouldn't be uh, messing around with, stents or revascularization. So one of the cases of uh, direction atherectomy that we used in specific cases, this patient was very high risk. The contralateral leg is already lost and had already calcified. You could use a silver hawk, but uh, I use it with IVAS guidance and make a couple of cuts and total of five passes. You can get some plaque. It doesn't mean anything by showing off what plaque we took. It, everybody will get some plaque out. The key is to use a filter. Be careful with this because Without a filter, if this plaque goes down, it can be troublesome. And be careful with the cuts in between. The tip of the device can get cut off. And uh, post-balloon angioplasty, the results look good. As I mentioned, acutely these look good, but long-term you'd need to have a decent follow-up. This was done for just a poor wound healing, and I think it re-narrowed within six months, but hopefully as, the wound, as long as the wound is healing, we should be okay. So another case of uh, <clears throat> common femoral end me previously, and patient had a atherosclerotic plaque involving both SFA and the co common femoral artery. A couple of cuts, and still you have a little bit of dissection plane. Maybe it's at the patch, it's showing up like that, but uh, it's not flow limiting. Again, in these cases, we do use a filter, and the results are pretty acceptable. But again, these are all acute results. Everything looks pretty OK. This is from uh, Dr. Laird, who trained me. He showed a case that uh, where Profunda was almost subtotally occluded. He was able to cross and do a few cuts for heavily calcified ones. And uh, you can get decent results. Again, filter is very much needed. Another case example where even uh, when SFA, when the Profunda is subtotally occluded, um, you could do this and get away, but these cases You've got to be really careful because this patient is just dependent upon the patent SFA and a few collaterals. If things go bad, you could lose the leg of this patient. Role of orbital atherectomy for common femoral, there is some role. Sometimes it's not completely best results, but uh, you have to have a balance between how far aggressive you can take it and how much uh, you're going to stop. Here is an 85-year-old patient with coronary disease, peripheral arterial disease, and previous common femoral artery procedure and stenting of the SFA in 2007. Patient had a directional atherectomy in the past, and she came back with a non-healing ulcer from three to four months. And the image showed subtotal occlusion. We were able to cross initially. I did put a filter, and I was trying to protect the profunda. It's kind of hard. It's not like in a LAD DAG where you could put a microcatheter and get away, but uh, a couple of runs of CSI, and followed by kissing balloon and a drug eluting balloon. The results are not the greatest. If you see, there's a little bit of residual plaque or a rolled intima, but uh, the gradients were not that high. I still left it with that, with a single vessel runoff. She does have the wound healing, and we just leave it alone. We don't need to bring back. But here is why common femoral artery angioplasty may not be the best option in everybody. This is something that I did. I'm not proud of, but I thought I should show this, uh, because we always tend to show only the best things. Here is a 62-year-old patient with known PAD, bilateral claudication in uh, March of uh, 2022 and extraneous artery stent. Patient is poor historian. He's got history of colon resection, radiation at age 15, and recent colostomy for colon cancer. Left ABA was 0.77, and uh, that was done six months ago. Patient came to the clinic, although he walked. It's hard to justify to say he had rest pain because he walked into the clinic. He had absent common femoral artery pulse and popliteal pulse. Patient was on 
kind of optimal treatment, but he does use tobacco and also cocaine use. I brought him to the lab without much of pre-testing, which is kind of my mistake. I should have gotten a CT scan, all of these things before. But uh, you can see the, despite a recent balloon angioplasty, common femoral art, common iliac artery and extra iliac artery was all occluded. And Profunda is open, distal common femoral artery is open. So because of his previous radiation, I thought it may be high risk for surgery. We, uh, went from the uh, contralateral side and ipsilateral. I had a small sheath, crossed the lesions, did an IVUS, heavily calcified plaque, did a 2 max with uh, CSI, followed by drug eluting balloon, shock wave, and then a drug eluting balloon. And then realigned both the common iliacs with uh, covered stents with uh, two VBXs and an ex external iliac artery left one with a epic stent. You can see the results look okay, but if you look at it carefully, it's really uh, not a good result. What I got, common femoral artery has more than 30% residual lesion. PK described this, one of the downfalls of common femoral artery is if you have a residual lesion, it's more than 30%. Here, it's almost 50% uh, recoil, and you can see the common femoral artery is smaller than the external iliac artery, smaller than SFA, smaller than profunda. So this patient came back with some abdominal pain when we got the CT scan. Actually, the whole uh, common femoral artery to the external iliac artery, everything was occluded. He needed common femoral endarterectomy, which I thought is high risk. Actually, it was not. They got it, got it through, and um, the, my surgical colleagues were able to realign and restand the external iliac artery. So key thing to know is the data is very limited. Stenting also has some data, but this is one of the largest one that was published a couple of um, years ago during the COVID time. It's, if you, it's only balloon angioplasty, but it's still drug allergic balloon angioplasty. It's still not as good as endarterectomy. The patency rates are low both one year and two year due to all the reasons we mentioned because of residual stenosis, because of the plaque and recoil. So in conclusion, common femoral artery for calcified lesions, maybe for high-risk patients, there's an alternate. You may need atherectomy and some drug eluting balloon, but atherectomy is not needed in every case. Rare cases may need self-expanding stent, but long-term outcomes are not established, and even the self-expanding stents can crush. Choice of the device is case-based and operator-based. A large-scale prospective randomized study is really needed. And again, respect the common femoral artery and profunda, think twice especially in a clotic end before you treat the common femoral. Great, Dr. Dapa. Thank you so much. Uh, so many nice cases. Uh, I'm going to start with the panel and start from Drew here. Um, what's, let's make, let's uh, agree that we made a decision to treat the common femoral artery. Walk me through the algorithm that you use in regards to your approach of, one, whether you're going to use debulking or not or plaque modification. And if you are, uh, how do you decide which one? Thanks, Mehdi. So I do a lot of work in the uh, common femoral. I do think it's it's uh, potential to work on and get pretty good results depending upon what you're dealing with and also depending upon who the patient is. It's It's got to be done in a, a multidisciplinary approach as well. And I think my algorithm is it depends upon how much calcium they have. I think it depends upon where that calcium is. Is it posterior? Is it Involving the profunda, I treat this like an LED, like an LED left main circ. Is it Medina one one one? Are you going to get into the profunda? Are you not? Um, you know, uh, do you need to do? What do you need to? Tr you need to get good flow. You need to get a good outcome. So for me, um, sometimes if you have to, I'll take an eight French crossover and do directional atherectomy with two wires, with two filters, one in the profunda, one in the SFA. Being careful to make sure that you and doing atherectomy on the profunda first going more uh, lateral and then going to the SFA and go more medial, and then the middle, and then, uh, you know, cutting very specifically. And Aravinder, I want to uh, uh, give you props for using IVIS. I think using IVIS for all this is going to be important because you really want to know where you're going. In the era of IVL, I think IVL, especially with big balloons, uh, seven, eight millimeter balloons, really sizing well, and IVL has made it a lot easier without having to do directional atherectomy. And so for me, uh, I'm using a lot of IVL with IVIS guidance, so I'm getting a one-to-one -one and then DCB after that. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the key thing is each individual patient, you can't do one one way. You've got to tailor it patient to patient depending upon what it looks like. Is any difference, anything you do differently? So my approach is, uh, you know, we have a multidisciplinary team for uh, limb-threatening ischemia. One of the ways I keep my vascular surgeons happy, send all the common femoral to them. 
I don't even look at them. I used to do a little bit more. So now I only do when they say no. If the patient is high risk or obese or high, high chance of infection, then only I do the common flu lab. Then you will consider it. And if you were to consider it, and uh, do you, how, do you, well, how do you judge whether you're going to do debulking or not? Do you, do you always do it? or No. So heavy calcified lesions, I usually, uh, if I have to do it, I'll do atherectomy, either rotabletter or orbital atherectomy, mm -hmm. probably orbital, and then go shockwave. Right. And uh, I try to avoid stent unless I have to. Right. Uh, if there is a focal lesion, mostly fibro fatty plaque, mm -hmm. I may go for pantherus or, you know, I, I, we don't have turbo hawk. That mm -hmm. is the approach I do. Then, then do DCB. Okay. Um, and you, do you ever do combination therapy with uh, shockwave? Like, you know, uh, we just mentioned Verghese, you know, he does orbital sometimes followed by shockwave. Um, have you done that, Drew? Uh, so I have done combination therapy. I think the key thing it depends upon what your ibis looks like, right? So if you're if you have a lot of stalactites, stalagmites, especially that posterior plaque that can be so nasty, you know you can use directional for that. And then if you have a lot of adventitial, like heavy calcification that's going to inhibit your balloon, just like we talked about in the coronary session, what I may do is do directional, see how the balloon inflates, and if I'm starting to get still getting a residual waste, then I'll switch over to use IVL. Yeah, I've seen a number of cases, you know, at these, some of these meetings where people are using combination. How about you, Dan? And then we walk down to Peter and... Uh... Yeah, so, you know, at, at one of these meetings not too long ago, a vascular surgeon, it might have been Dr. Clare, told me about how eccentrically plaque tends to layer in the common femoral. And um, I, I ibis all these now for a couple of reasons. One is you see that. You see that it really tends to just be posteriorly layered plaque. And um, when you set those pictures up in directional atherectomy, which, which tends to be my primary go-to, I'll use directional atherectomy there. If there's a high calcium burden, we'll shockwave sometimes in combination. The other benefit to, to ibis is you'll oftentimes see a really big size mismatch between that common femoral and that SFA. And uh, you can take advantage of that information and differentially treat to size to really try to avoid carina dissection, which is where you compromise the profunda. You know, I, I, I still think that primary therapy for common femoral disease is surgical. Yeah. It's, and there are very few patients who are not good candidates for it. Yeah. And 10% return to the operating room is outrageously high. I mean, I'm not sure where that, that slide came from or what those figures were, but it's, it's unusual to have to bring a patient back to the operating room if you have an experienced surgeon. But at the end of the day, there's a group of patients who've either had radiation therapy in the groin, they've had extensive cancer resections, they may have had prior endarterectomy, and, and honestly, endarterectomy can be repeated. Patchy angioplasties can be done in those situations. But there are a group of patients who need intervention. And for most of those, I'm, I'm not using atherectomy. If I do anything like that, I'm primarily using if they have heavy calcium, I'm using shockwave, and I'm using medicated balloons. I'm trying not to stent. I mean, Kuhn Deleuze has run a study in Europe where he used Supera in the, in the common femoral artery, but Kuhn doesn't talk at all about the, the profunda. What he talks about is patency of the common femoral. And yeah, 12 months, it looks okay. It's not as good as endarterectomy but there's no indication of what happens to the profunda, and I don't want my profunda stented over at the end of the day. Yes. Uh, Chris, anything to add to this discussion? Oh, I agree with them. Directional atherectomy is my mainstay. Unless it's really calcified, then I shock away. Right. Then one of the, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, it's a very nice surgical procedure, and honestly, in my own experience with my colleagues, the result, I would say, greater than 95% of the time comes out very nicely. The biggest issue I've had is groin infection, to be honest with you, and that's the one. And I don't know, sometimes, you know, when the, the groin infection comes, I guess maybe those cases just get engraved because they get to be very challenging. You know, it's like it's not an easy complication to overcome. Uh, what do you think is, are there select patients or... What's so, the issue? Uh, yeah, so I think the patients who wind up with groin infections are patients who have some other issue going on. So, I mean, we're doing a femoral endarterectomy at the time that you are repairing, uh, you know, an angiographic injury to the artery or they've had a prior angiographic injury. If you look at risks for infection, the risks are diabetes, obesity, and prior surgery or prior intervention in that groin. Those are the three, the big three. 
And those are things that might lead you to consider doing an interventional therapy rather than a, than a surgical therapy. But I, I got to tell you that with bovine pericardium, which is a biologic that you put on the artery rather than Dacron, the, the occurrence of patch infections or infection of the vessel, which is really the critical issue, is very, very unusual in current day surgical practice. It's, it's very unusual. And do you agree that you know when these are done, there should definitely be an extension into the profunda, uh, that this is routine, right? This is standard of care. Yeah, I mean, the dissection, the surgical dissection to do a femoral end arterectomy involves a dissection beyond the first branch point of the profunda. If you're not doing that, you're not actually treating the patient effectively. I think that's some of the challenges is that, you know, sometimes both just like we can do wrong endovascular, there are some people out there that are not doing the correct, and that's why maybe we see some of this re-entry to the OR and repeat procedures, you know, surgically. Yeah, Mehdi, I think, you know, we do have the TECO trial, which was a randomized controlled trial of endo versus surgical. There's no difference. I think, I mean, I'm, I practice in the South, so, you know, it's, it's hard to find half these groins. And so when you got panis overlying, overlying another, and then, you know, you're just set up for a nice and moist, and when those uh, environment for bacteria, those are the infections. I think the, the infection of the vessel is relatively rare. It's everything else. It's in between, so. And, and I, I practice in the South as well, so, I mean, both of us are in the same environment. We're, uh, and honestly, but I, I saw the same thing in Ohio. You know, most people need two seats to sit on rather than one in the patients we're dealing with. I mean, you know, the, the reality is that, I mean, I mean, I think the other issue is that there is heterogeneity of care, just like, you know, uh, there are, you know, very talented and experienced endovascular operators, there are very talented, experienced surgeons, and I think it's the commitment also, to be honest with you. And, uh, and to, just to be fair, I think that not every area we have expertise, just because you do very good work in the aorta, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are a good surgeon to do endarterectomy have a common femoral. Maybe you don't have the passion for it. Maybe you're not as committed as you are uh, spending seven hours doing a fenestrated, you know, you know, T-bar or something like that. So I think there's a lot of complexity to it, uh, honestly. And the, the one thing that I kind of talk a lot about with the common femoral is it's almost like a base point from which you can treat iliacs into a well end arterectomized segment. You can treat an SFA with a, knowing that you have a good origin of that SFA to intervene upon. It's the one advantage, I think, of hybrid therapy is that if you can, if you can make that common femoral and its bifurcation branches healthy at, with an end arterectomy, you know, you can stent a long segment above it and know that it's going to do really well. And you can intervene on a long segment below it and feel very confident that you're going to have good inflow and it's not going to be as, as compromised potentially. Uh, you know, there are times where I'm doing a femoral end arterectomy because I want to do an intervention on an SFA and there's heavy disease at the, at the origin of the SFA and I don't want that to impair my ability to have a good outcome from an intervention. So, I, I kind of use it as, uh, you know, when we treat people with Marfans who have aneurysmal disease, if you have a segment of the aorta that is grafted, you can put a stent graft into it and feel very confident that that stent graft is going to hold on to it and the segment of that's, you know, grafted is not going to be problematic. I feel the same way about the common femoral artery. You can stent into it and you're not going to have an issue after that. So I, I just, you know, for me, it's still a very surgical spot, but again, there are patients who, who just for one reason or another are not good candidates for it. Let me pick you, your brain on, you know, since we have level of time, is there additional risk if you have done an endarthrectomy and now you want to, on top of that, do a fem pop? Does that make it more complicated? Is there any issues with that? Or is it better, would that lean you to a hybrid approach of doing endo? Like, would that push you to do a hybrid or you don't think there is a much of an issue surgically? No, that's a great point. But I, I don't think it actually impacts you at all. And the reason is, the if you've done an endarterectomy cor correctly, you've, you've revascularized the profunda. And if you're having to do a fem pop for one reason or another, you can actually just take the bypass graft off the profunda. You can do what's called a lateral approach to the profunda. And it's an easy approach. If, you've, if they've had a good endarterectomy, it's a good inflow source. And I, I would say, you know, when I went to South Carolina, um, 
it was the first time in almost probably 15 years that I had done primary common femoral artery exposure for an end arterectomy because the vast majority of these people we're doing at complex institutions, you're treating reoperative groins from multiple prior procedures. You know, in experienced hands, again, I don't think it's a big deal to do to do a reoperation in a groin and to start a start a bypass graft from there if you need to as well. If the patient has had the prior fem pop, and uh, and now they need you know um, that that does that give it more difficulty if there is a prior failed fem pop one two fem pop from the does that make your job harder or is that also uh, not that big of a deal if you have to do end dart? I think anything that's been done to an artery intervention or bypass grafting makes the, the surgical approach more challenging because there's inflammation around it that wasn't there before. But frankly, if they have a PTFE graft in there that's occluded, in some ways that's kind of easy because it's like a handle you can pull the artery around with to do retraction. And you're going to take that off as you're, you know, you're going to remove that completely as part of what you're doing for the surgical bypass origin anyway. It, it does increase, you know, reoperations increase right. infection risk. Absolutely. I have an endovascular question. How many people use in, uh, embolic protection device during uh, CFA intervention? Uh, I usually don't do, but uh, there are a lot of fellows, and, uh, you know, I'm legally in a court of law, I'll be held accountable. That is a question I would like to post the panel. I mean, I think for, remember, a court of law is all as per what is done in your region. That's the, that's what the basis will be. So it's whatever's done in your region. Uh, sort of like ultrasound guided access, like is that what's done in your region? Uh, for me, directional atherectomy, 100% of the time I'm using embolic protection. You, if you don't think you're getting some emboli down there, and I think one of the biggest complaints or one of the biggest issues that happens with endo is you distal embolize and you start picking off distal vessels, and now we're getting into clodigans that become CLI patients, and that's when we do harm. Peter, any thoughts on this about embolic protection? I mean, I... Yeah, no, um, and my I get to talk about it later when we talk about my worst atherectomy case. It, so in the IFU for DA, it talks about total occlusions, heavily calcified disease, and poor tibial runoff. Um, like Drew, I, I tend to use it effectively all the time, and, and the more you use it, the better you get at it. Yeah, I, th I think it's a no-brainer, to be honest with you. If you're, a, if you're working on a common femoral and you're talking about calcium and, you know, putting atherectomy devices, you've got to protect it because you're going to make your job much harder if you don't do it, so uh, regardless of the court of law. Okay, let's move on. You know, we, our next case is Dr. Mac Ansari, and he's going to present uh, this SFA CTO was a nightmare. Mac. Hello, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, so I have been given a very interesting task and I like how Banerjee, Dr. Banerjee sugarcoated it and said the master's approach. And then I was asked to present uh, a difficult case, a nightmare case. So I would start with these definitions. So he said, Mac, I want a case that builds character and you want to talk about a SFA nightmare case. So I looked up the definition of these things to understand how, what it should be. Character is the mental and moral qualities distinct to an individual, and by talking about building one, is helping to make one emotionally stronger. So emotion is the word over there, more independent and better at dealing with problems. And then nightmare word got famous with the famous British uh, horror movie, Nightmare on Elm Street. So whenever I have a difficult case at the university, I say the nightmare on the fourth street, and a frightening and unpleasant dream or a terrifying experience, and how these are related will go over this in the end. So now these cases, when we call about difficult cases, nobody would remember, right? So I'm gonna quickly go over this one just to say, okay, 72-year-old Rutherford Five, completely occluded, uh, flush occlusion, very calcified vessel, you went through it, you did the machete technique, you opened the patient, the vascular teams uh, with the vascular surgeon sitting over there decided it's high risk, cannot get anesthesia, okay, we went in, 
a thorectomy or okay, should I do it? But this is a vascular surgeon asking me. At that time, the New York Times article was not there. So I said, okay, let's go ahead. We did the thorectomy because now apparently some people are claiming this causes CLI. Anyway, so we did the thorectomy, opened up the vessel, patient had no other thing, ballooned it. After ballooning also, we saw the micropros, put the stent in, and patient did really, really well, complete uh, 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 revascularization of the foot, and it's done, but we don't remember these cases, right? These are the usual everyday kind of cases that we do. So the question is, does this case build character? We did a thorectomy, completely flushed occlusion on somebody that has wounds, which was high risk for surgery, and was it a nightmare? No, it was not a nightmare. And then you get into these situations. So what is the case? 62-year-old guy, uh, acute on chronic issues, rather four to five, atherosclerosis of the lower extremity, with not only resting like pin and ulceration, he has prior cancer of the bone, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, but couldn't get surgery done. High risk for surgery due to his comorbidities. How do we know that? We have a PAD center of excellence. We sit down together with our vascular surgeons. Every case goes to the vascular team, like the heart team, and I document it really well. And this is the case, okay, I'm try trying to get this done. And of course, when I get into these cases, and when the surgeon says, I'm not gonna take it to surgery, you have to do, most of the time, it is the uh, reason is the anesthesiologist. This, we are doing the patient is awake, and we're trying to cross it in, and this is the kind of calcification we're dealing with. So forget about uh, embolic protection device. I couldn't even get in a catheter to change a wire in. I couldn't even cross the wire. What am I supposed to do now? And I, I am coming from below as well. This, this is bi-directional axis trying to get into this. The guy does not want to lose his leg. Cutting and amputating his leg is his choice and he says no to it. Patient is counseled and he doesn't want to get that done. He wants his leg, he goes to golfing and he wants to continue that. He had bone cancer and through the cancer he lived and it was never done. So he said the vessel should be fixed. Then we're trying to cross again. And if you see I'm coming from below, my wire is there through the catheter. I'm coming from above, I'm trying to meet in between. And somehow I did cross from below that point, I did cross from above. I see uh, multiple micro perforations over there, not into the intima, but more like connecting me to the, some of the venous structures. But I'm still within the zone of the vessel, and I checked at multiple directions, and I'm stuck over here. I called the vascular surgeon, and he said, no, Mac, high risk for surgery. You have to deal with it yourself. I trust you. That's, you know, that's like good consoling to do. You know, it actually helps. So who do I vent out with? Unfortunately, to the fellow. I have to vent out with somebody, right? I cannot vent out to the nurses and staff. I'll be written up. So poor fellow is in my direct range. And this is the trouble I have. Absolutely, Dr. Shishuba, this is a nightmare. Would you agree? So at this point, I'm remembering my grandmother. At this point, I'm remembering I'm, I'm cursing the surgeon who left me with this case. So I'm trying to cross into it. I'm, I'm using the machete technique, and finally I felt I'm successful. I felt that thing where I was able to go through that membrane and make a pass through after initial approaches failed, and uh, uh, tried the rotatory motion of difficult wires helped, and then finally I, I was okay. I have something going through and through. Those are the collateral that I was able to get into, and now I have this connection but I'm still stuck. This is what I call the dance of the calcium. Uh, because what happens is, I like this habit when I see I cannot cross, I try to push into it to see if the calcium dances. Because what it tells me is I'm still within the vessel, and if I'm in the vessel, it's very, uh, very helpful for me. But you see the, the severe disease and calcification in that part of the vessel, which is the common femoral, and the SFA, like, this should have been gone to surgery. Should I complain about my vascular surgeon? Dr. Santana would kill me, he's a good friend. He runs the PAD Center of Excellence with me and he's an amazing surgeon. And patient had radiation therapy. Patient had multiple chemo episodes. We saw the bone kicking out. And this is the bone, if you look at the bone, this is the cancer we were talking about and patient has multiple comorbidities and cannot go through surgery. 
And this is what we're going, apparently the uh, chemotherapy people were telling me it is responding and he's doing well. So yes, apparently it is. So looks like in that case, medication works. In our case, should I just leave him on Xeralta? Is it going to help him? Is this thing going to go away? So when we are talked about blaming interventional cardiologists about doing these big, heavy cases, we have reasons. Absolutely. So now we're trying to pass in, trying to change the wires. And I did a thorectomy because I couldn't pass even the smallest size balloon in there. So after doing a thorectomy, I made the connection from down below, and I connected the vessels to the two-vessel flow down below. Actually, two and a half, if you want to go with the Ginelli classification. I'm doing multiple ballonings, whatever I can get, whatever flow I can get down over there. I have some flow. I still have an issue over there, but I have to batch it up. Now, I do not also like to put in stents to stents. Is this a case you want to do the entire stent? No, I love DCB. I'm a huge pro proponent of DCB. But all, uh, did DCB also suffer, Dr. Shishobha, when somebody put in an article, it's killing, and for all these years, the patients who did not get DCB because the hospitals took it away from the shelf saying that there is a publication that shows that, and now everybody is saying everything is right. So who's going to be responsible for the patients who did not get the DCB because of that article that was published by our journal without looking into details about it, right? It's unfortunate, but anyway. So let's see now. So then I went ahead with, after finishing my atherectomy, I have good flow going down. I'm still within the vessel. I don't see any major perforations and stuff. I still see the okay, flow connecting down in different zones. Okay, that's fine. And I decided I'm going to do a combination. I'm going to do a drug-coated balloon angioplasty where I can do it. And the other, I'm going to put a stent in. So now the decision of the stent, what kind of stents? Because people say criticize. You don't want to put in covered stents. You want to put in non-covered stents. You want to put in drug-eluting stents. Well, I did the DCB, but I, now I want to go for a covered stent because I see microperforations and connections with the venous structure over there. So I did Wyabon in the distal part, and I did DCB in the proximal part, thinking that in future, if its chemotherapy is better and if he ever goes to surgery, that common femoral can be correctly taken care of. Right now, we want to get two vessel flow down, and we get two vessel flow down. So this is our conclusion. Successful percutaneous intervention of a severely calcified and occluded long segment of an SFA via dual access approach, anti-grade and retrograde coming down from pedal, the pedal vessels were completely fine. The patient had a two-year follow-up. His cancer is doing much better. With a thorectomy, was used regular scoring balloon. Now, people say for one year, if you're achieved, it's a big thing. This is the two-year follow-up you're talking about. He's an aspirin, PGY2s. I continue the PGY2s forever in these patients. Radiation was 1350. Contrast was 220. Procedure time, 183 minutes. Everything was done ultrasound guidance. So back to the question, was it a nightmare? I felt it. It was horrifying. So absolutely, it was a night fair. Now, did it build character? Yes, it did build character. So that's the last point I want to say is nightmare cases are directly proportional to character building, specifically for those people who do these cases. Thank you very much. Dr. Ansari, thank you so much. First of all, I want to uh, thank and appreciate all of our presenters, especially when we are talking about complications and difficult cases. and. You know, Dr. Clare showed the dissection of the carotid. Dr. Dapa showed that complicated, you know, occlusion of the iliac, and you showing this SFA pop. At the end of the day, there is a lot of passion, and we are all interested in taking care of these complex patients. Um, I think there is, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know, you know, there is a lot of discussion here about this article in New York Times, and I think we need to kind of maybe spend five minutes because there is a lot of emotions. You know, in this meeting, people have sideline jabbed at it, they have directly jabbed at it, they have discussed it, there is, I think maybe I spent five, six minutes, you know, and, and just get a sense of, and uh, Drew, you've been very active in trying to uh, get a, you know, a statement from the societies. Um, and what are your thoughts, the, your global over, you know, overarching thoughts about what, what's right and, the, and your thoughts about the article? Many, that's a, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like Katsunos all over again, I think, in a lot of ways. And I think the challenge is, if you guys haven't seen this last Sunday, in the New York Times, on the front page was an, an article entitled, they came to say they're, you know, basically someone came to 
get their legs worked on an OBL, and many patients had um, amputations, and there's an accusations about atherectomy increasing amputations and a variety of other things, and direct targeting of several physicians, including uh, uh, somebody who had an OBL uh, and performed a number of procedures on an individual patient who eventually uh, lost their leg. So um, I think the challenge is that we have as providers is to understand that we have very, very sick patients. If the patients have critical limb ischemia, you know, limb-threatening ischemia, these are patients that, you know, as we know from the best CLI trial, 33% are going to be dead at three years. So these are very, very sick patients. And the foundations of, of care, I think all of us, especially uh, those with a medical background, are very focused on ensuring that your patient's on goal-directed medical therapy, right? And so we know that an antiplatelet agent an angiotensin receptor blocker, ACE inhibitor, a statin, and smoking sensation not only improves morbidity and, mor and like mortality, as we know from Aaron Armstrong's work, but also increases uh, limb limbs and not losing limbs. And so I think it's really important to understand that the foundation is there. In terms of, you know, where things are going, and, and that's the imperative thing, and we have to do this in the setting of a multidisciplinary team. Um, all these patients are very, very ill. They have bad outcomes, and we have to make certain that they're on goal-directed medical therapy because who cares what their legs can do if they're dead. Uh, that's first and foremost. Number two, I, and I kind of take the, the approach of PAD is four things, right? And I learned this from Heather Gornick at the Cleveland Clinic. It's, a, it's PAD is prevention, uh, protection, and then plumbing. And we got to talk about foot care and protection and working with a uh, multidisciplinary team with our colleagues from podiatry and then prevention of cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. And then for those patients that are symptomatic, going on for revascularization. And surgical and endo is a very complementary, not competitive option. And I think it's all about figuring out what's the best thing for your patient. Again, is uh, appropriateness is about the right procedure for the right patient at the right time. And understanding that for an individual side is important. As per the landscape, you know, should things be done in ASC and OBL settings versus going in a hospital setting? Let's face it, our health uh, healthcare costs are, are driving up across the United States, and CMS has funded and pushed people to do procedures as an outpatient uh, in OBLs and ASCs to save cost. I think it's very challenging if we don't have a system set up that basically says you have to report your outcomes, you have to have quality assurance, you have to make certain that we're doing things through registries to make certain that people are not only doing the right thing, but we are accountable for what we do. And I think it's really important that, again, we do the right thing for the right patient at the right time. Appropriate use criteria are important that we work together in a team to make certain that all of our patients have the best outcomes. Now, you know, I was going to ask, uh, you know, Dr. Claire to comment about, and Peter, after, maybe after that, you. Um, one of the challenges, honestly, that I see from this the field is that, you know, CMS uh, is not aligned with what we believe is the right thing to do. So when you don't reimburse DCB and you incentivize based on, uh, on equipment that are not level one, so level one, multiple randomized trials, showing efficacy doesn't get reimbursed, but yet other equipment that are useful, don't get me wrong, we all use, I use atherectomy, and we know that it's necessary for some lesions and some situations, but you get a significant reimbursement. So I feel like on this, at the same time, as Drew said, it, you know, we are encouraging people to open up these ASCs. This is because we save money because of the cost of doing this in the inpatient setting, in the in a hospital setting. So how do, it's, it's like unfair, it's like we are, pushing people in the wrong path. And uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts, anything about the article or about this discussion. So I would just say CMS has perverse incentives for a number of different things that we do. As, a, as an example outside of limb ischemia, physicians are compensated exactly the same whether they treat an aneurysm with an endograft or they treat an aneurysm with open surgery. There is no question in my mind that the level of energy that I expend performing an open aneurysm and removing an endograft after it's failed, or even just doing a straightforward open aneurysm, is a lot more time, a lot more energy, a lot more follow-up than doing an EVAR. You do an EVAR, you're done in the time it takes you in the operating room, patient leaves the hospital the next day, they walk into your office a month later and you're looking at a CT scan and you might fret about an endo leak, but 
you're probably not going to do anything to them again for a couple of years. Somebody comes into my office after, you know, they have an open aneurysm repair. They're in the hospital for a week to 10 days. I'm seeing them every day. Maybe they spend a day in the ICU. You know, in, in an early aneurysm, maybe they're out in three to five days, but it's still a lot more time. I'm talking with them over the phone. I'm managing the discomfort they have from their incision through the first month. I'm seeing them in the office in the month. I'm making sure that their, their diet's back to regular, their activity's back to regular. It's a lot more time and effort but I'm compensated exactly the same. So, you know, for that reason, 90% plus of aneurysms are treated with endografts because it's a hell of a lot easier to do. And the fact is that, you know, if you own an OBL and you get reimbursed for doing atherectomy more than you do for doing a medicated balloon, it's gonna wind up happening. It doesn't matter what, you know, who you are. And, and at the end of the day, all of us have, <laughs> have patients that we, you know, we look back and can say, geez, that outcome was horrible. I mean, anybody, how many people in this room have been sued? Yeah, I mean, having, having been sued is like uh, an, an affront on your person. And every, if you've ever been sued, any aspect of what you do in the care of that patient. If you took a vacation while the patient happened to be having their problem, can be brought up in court and is viewed by the jury in a very different light than you happen to not have taken a vacation for the last year. You know, I think these articles, when they're written like this, they can highlight problems and bring out particular patients and create a, an environment where it looks outrageously bad. Um, you know, it's unfortunate that that's the way this comes across, but the bottom line is there has to be some improvement in what CMS does for compensation and reimbursement to physicians because I personally believe it, it is driving. I mean, that article highlights what I think most of us know is that in the outpatient setting, atherectomy has gone up incredibly high compared to the inpatient population treated and it's not just because we're taking the atherectomy patients out of the hospitals to treat them. So hey, maybe last comment, Peter, before we move on. I, I was just going to say one of, the, one of the most fascinating but terrible parts of this is that, you know, the same week the whole country is reading about how therapies for PAD are being massively overused for profit, we're sitting here and we're watching talks about the lack of availability of care for patients. I mean, Dr. Bunty gave an incredible talk about the fact that um, highest risk patients don't have access to these therapies. We saw it in one of the talks that even in the most highly treated communities and neighborhoods, 58% I think was the number of patients are getting amputation without therapy. And we're talking about both of these things at the same time. And we've gotta be cognizant as a field that when we're doing outreach to these vulnerable communities, now more than ever, the, the, the thought process going on in the world is gonna be, well, are we, are we overusing? Um, the caveat to this and, and something we need to work on as a field is, you know, so I, I sit on NCDR PCI and we look at the coronary space, 99% of places that do PCI submit metrics to NCDR and they're tracked because they need to for chest pain accreditations or for availability of services. We need to do better at that as well, you know, whether it's VQI or XLPAD or, or, or these registries, we really need to be submitting this data to keep track of these things. Yeah, I mean, I think we have to be united, you know, and not try to fish in dirty water. And the, the reality is that when that article came, I went to New York Times and I did a search on amputation to see if they have had any articles about all the challenges that we've been talking about the last three days, all the things that Matt talks about, the disparities, the underserved, the tobacco bill, this, that, you know, zero. Zero, but you know the news wants to sensationalize, and they want to, you know, they want to sell. They want to sell, they know, a uh, newspaper, and uh, and I think, and if we are not united, if we are not united, and we try as some societies and others, they're, you know, take advantage of an article like this, and instead of unitedly, actually advocate and educate our patients, it does hurt the field, it does hurt the patients, it does undermine us. The trust is gone. I mean, you know, there are people that. I don't know, I'm hearing physicians telling me that their patients are coming now and saying that, you know, are you gonna use atherectomy on me or no, because I don't wanna lose my leg. So uh, I, I, I don't know, but there is a lot going on and I hope you will just push us to be more united and work together. For but the but just a quick question, Mehdi, just a science question, because there's a surgeon from Hopkins who actually puts that on Twitter. It's a science question, not the fact that the Michigan vascular surgeons, four of them that have been attacking GRs forever, wake up seven in the morning on a Sunday 
and put 12 treats right one after the other. I did not know vascular surgeons of Michigan wake up seven in the morning and read New York Times. That's a different thing. But the question is, we saw the same thing in carotids and TAVR and renal stenting and all other collaborative things we saw that the question is on science, does a thorectomy causes CLI? Because that's what they're talking about, and that's the question. Right. I mean, I think that, you know, at least based on the, you know, anyway, I know you're asking me a loaded question, but the bottom line is that we all use these devices. Our colleagues across different specialties, interventional radiologists, vascular surgeons, cardiologists, they use these technologies, and if you misabuse or misuse it, any technology, you can cause harm. So it's more the operator or the people that are using it or the right indication, the inappropriate patient, and so on and so forth. I don't think these devices have been approved by FDA. They have been studied, you know, whether you, in whatever uh, requirement that the FDA requires them to get approval. So it's not like we are making things up in the back table and we're putting it in patients. So anyway, I think this is going to be a six-hour discussion. and. And, uh, but I just wanted, because this is keep coming up, and there are some people maybe in the audience that are not aware of the article. So with that, I'm going to move to your case, and what, how appropriate. Yeah. My worst anatomy <laughs> case, so Peter, a, you know, really good luck, buddy. It's a really comfortable setup for this talk, Mitty. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, so my name is Peter Monteleone. I'm here in Austin. So I direct our cath labs locally for Ascension Seton and our research program at the University of Texas. Um, I'm not from Texas. I was born in New York. Most of my training was in Cleveland and Boston. When I came here, I learned a term. Um, which I'm going to introduce as a parting gift to everyone from Austin, which is the term goat rope. And so, so, so what is a goat rope? So a goat rope is when a bunch of cowboys are trying to get better at lassoing in general. So they put 20 goats in, in an area with a bunch of cowboys, and there's ropes flying everywhere and goats flying everywhere. And in a lot of places in Texas, Matt might have heard this, we'll use this to refer to these cases that are just chaos and bad things keep happening and they keep going on and it takes twice as long as it should and you'll refer to it as a goat rope. So this is gonna be my goat rope. So um, these are my disclosures here. I, I, I personally, you know, I've never gotten an atherectomy device stuck myself. I've tried to get two out. Uh, I've got one out, but those weren't mine. Um, you know, I, we, I've had minor perforations that we've sealed with covered stents and things, but I kind of wanted to go over something a little more complicated. So this was a 68-year-old guy, bad PAD, prior interventions, a left SFA stent, a prior left popliteal angioplasty three years ago, came in um, a couple years ago at this point now with CLTI with a non-healing left heel ulceration, and also really bad getting worse pain. Um, interestingly, he has terrible cardiac disease, and he didn't come in because he had a heel wound. He was we got called by his heart failure doctor because they were thinking about putting a cardia MEMS in, and then he told them he had a big heel on his wound. They certainly didn't want to put an implantable, but this also brought it to everyone's attention. And so we had non-invasive imaging in advance, but it showed us what we found. So his aorta iliac system was okay. His SFA was occluded. That stent was occluded. There was really no flow collateralizing from the SFA down. You could see a little bit of hazy flow in the tibials coming when you shot higher from the iliacs, allowing profunda collateralization to show you things. But the stent was gone, and so that arrow is just pointing at the stent, which doesn't project very well, but right at the level of the stent, we had a complete occlusion, and you just couldn't see much else. But this was a guy with a terrible wound. This was a guy who no one wanted to take for surgery if he even had outflow, um, and this was someone who was developing progressive rest pain. So we put a sheath up and over, and the thought was, well, let's, let's get a wire down. Let's see if we can get across. Let's see if we can see that kind of tibial reconstitution. And that glide wire went easily, in fact, too easily, concerningly easily, right? And so the glide wire crossed, but then the glide wire kind of stopped at the P1 segment, and there was a little bit of a lake of contrast there, so we chased with a microcatheter. We took a picture beyond the, the stent occlusion, and, and we saw this picture. So this is kind of P1 to P3, and it was behaving on the wire like it was calcium and exophytic terrible calcium, but there was also a chance it was thrombus, including thrombus that we just pushed down. Hard to tell what all that was. And so, you know, the, the question becomes, is it clot, is it thrombus? This is what it looked like before we did anything to it. So there's certainly just dense tubular bad calcium in that area, which is below that stent that was thrombotically occluded, and now we couldn't put a wire through it easily. Um, we were able to navigate that channel. So we navigated that channel. We chased it with that same trailblazer. It got across it, thankfully. We took a picture, and we've got some outflow. So your AT stops right there. The PT was coming down with a, with a direct distal injection to the level of the heel. So we thought if we can get this inflow through P3 fixed, we'd, we'd be in good shape. Um, 
But the question becomes what to do next. And we were in this world where there was a bunch of calcium. We were in this world where there was a bunch of thrombus. And so as we were kind of deciding what to do, we did want to get embolic protection for the reasons kind of discussed earlier for both thrombus or calcium when we worked on it, especially in the setting of limited one vessel runoff. So it hits, hits all those buttons. So we, we deployed a spider down, a little kind of mini trick. You know, the spider, the hoop is what's occlusive and covering your territory. So we left to cover as much as possible. We left the spider kind of right above the trifurcation. So that basket it was really protecting what we had of that remnant AT and its collaterals as well as the PT. So, so the short summary is we had a stent that we didn't know how long it was down, but a wire flew through it. So we assumed some large portion of it was, was thrombus. We had dense uh, popliteal calcification. We managed to get a spider. Um, this was a few years ago. So this was a world before shockwave. This was a world before Rotorex. I, I didn't have jet stream. When we think about jet stream, sometimes when we think about kind of mixed clot plus calcium, at this point, a few years ago, I wasn't ivising as much, whether there'd be value to that or not, but we kind of had the tools that we had. So thrombus is terrifying, right? Thrombus embolizes distally. Organized thrombus that didn't happen yesterday is even worse. But so the thought was, let's try to deal with the thrombus. So we had a wire down, we had a spider down, we put a CAT7 down through that SFA stent, trying to debulk thrombus, and, and it did almost nothing. So, so now we still had no flow going through that SFA stent. We still couldn't see anything kind of antegrade through that area. It just looked the same as it looked before. And so we're battling through ideas. Did we just do nothing? Did we push some thrombus down distally, but we still had no outflow because there's no collaterals getting down there? Did we embolize to our, into our spider? Did it manage to find clot getting its way? through um, that, that eccentric calcium. We thought about, you know, do we just drip TPA at this point to try and clear things up? But there was so much distal disease and we had this filter and it was like, well, let's think about this. You know, we did a little low undersized angioplasty with a 2040 nanocross for a couple of reasons. One, I really wanted to be able to penumbra all the way down in case there was thrombus kind of sitting in the spider itself and I couldn't get the penumbra down at this point. Um, two, we think maybe we'd get some outflow and at least we'd get a picture and we could see what's going on. It, still did nothing. And so at this point, we just still couldn't see anything besides some contrast that was now hanging inside the spider. So we assumed there was at least some amount of thrombus down there that might be occluding our outflow. So we wanted to get the spider out, but we didn't want to lose our wire. And so if you're ever in that situation, you can capture an embolic protection device while leaving a wire in case you lose your channel. Um, for the operator's enclave, you know, the way you do that, you bring a, some microcatheter. We used a trailblazer down over the wire, stopping proximal to the spider. You introduce another wire just short of the spider. The keys do not push that second wire through the spider. Otherwise, when you try and capture the spider, it'll mangle everything into a mass. Then you take your trailblazer out. Then you just bring in your capture device or a microcatheter over the spider to bring it down short and, and then withdraw that first spider wire and you're left with a wire that's down there distal. So the short version is we took our spider out, we still had a wire down. And then we take a picture with the spider removed and, and we've still, we've got a little flow now. So, so for the first time, we actually have a little flow getting through the SFA stent. We still see this kind of weird looking, we know it's some degree calcium, maybe some thrombus that's sitting there, but probably just this calcific bad disease that historically had been atherectomized and, uh, once before. And so then it's like, okay, w what do we do? We've got, we've got bad calcium. Um, we're extending into the P3 segment. We certainly just don't want to angioplasty it and tear it. And, and, you know, when we think about no stent zones, it's less than ideal. Um, so we want to do some degree of atherectomy. So we put a viper wire down. It was bulky, dense calcium. We put a CSI solid crown down. And so we did that, and then we got no reflow again. So this, I think, is no reflow three on, on this atherectomy case. You sometimes see this, microembolization, poor runoff. You can make arguments about putting nav sixes down in this situation, but we're getting more and more kind of equipment deep into this scenario. And so at this point, we did what we sometimes will do after orbital atherectomy. We did another low pressure kind of inflation. Our balloon still is not opening. I mean, this is just a 2-0 balloon and it's not getting to size in that mid-segment. We gave a little arterial nitro. And at this point, we get a little flow back. So a little bit of flow return, but note that even after that solid crown had buzzed through plus that angioplasty, it doesn't look like we really accomplished much of anything. Persistent critical stenosis, small balloons that just aren't getting anywhere near size, even at 2.0. And so what else do you have? You're kind of running out of options. A thousand times out of a thousand times, today I'd shockwave this, right? We'd shockwave it and we'd treat. Shockwave was a twinkle in Dr. Klein's eye. And we, we just didn't have this at this point. So you kind of pick the enemy we know. Um, in this situation, we took a directional atherectomy device down. Now, directional atherectomy in stent is completely contraindicated. Don't do it. If you ever 
Do it completely contraindicated. Definitely don't do it at the inlet to the stent because your device will get stuck. Can you do it from the outlet of the stent, including that area at the bottom of the stent? Down you can, but bulky, dense calcium is certainly a, a bad challenge. The Hawk 1 systems are a lot better than Turbo Hawk and the old Silver Hawks because the drive line is different, the cutting teeth is different, the rotational speed is different. So we tried, and, and so this is a Hawk 1M, the popliteal device being pushed down. We kind of cut out of the stent terrible grinding sound. You can imagine it felt worse than it actually sounded. You know, one of the keys to directional atherectomy when you do a lot of it is when it stops, you don't want to just stop because it still has plaque kind of extending into the collection chamber. You try to rotate it as you advance to cut that piece out. And we tried to do that as much as we could, you know, to try to avoid cutting plaque off, but then leaving that plaque floating in the artery. And so then we take a picture when it comes out, and there's no reflow. So now we're at, we're at no reflow number three or four for this series of atherectomy cases. And so we did the same thing. We buddy wired a spider because the question was, well, did we catch stuff or are we in much worse shape? And so the spider was just full of stuff. So um, some of it was the linear cuts that we usually see with directional atherectomy. A lot of it was these mushrooms of kind of exophytic calcium. And the whole thing was just completely and totally and so this, I think, was our third or fourth kind of no reflow during this case. But the nice thing is, and I'll show you a video in a minute, we had the best channel I think we'd had before. And so the thought was, well, what do we do now? And um, what we do is we, we put a chocolate balloon uh, down. We did a 4-0, certainly undersized in this big person. I mean, if we Ivis this, he probably is a 6, you know, stretching down to a 4 and P3 vessel. We did a 4-0 chocolate, a 4-0 impact admiral DCB, and then DCB'd higher. And so, so we, had, we had this. And I was like, well, there's probably some ulceration up top in P1, if not clot up there. You know, there's certainly like a 70% residual up there. And so then the question becomes, you know, do you, do you line this? Um, you know, th this was his runoff, so we caught all that stuff distally. We had that PT that was still open. We had that AT still occluded. And so then you stand there for a minute, and you think, well, should I try to scaffold this? You know, I, I hadn't been able to get anything bigger than a 4.0 balloon, you know, to get to size. I certainly didn't want to tear it. This was below a stent that had previously thrombosed. This is above one vessel runoff. There might be some thrombus there. You know, in the modern era, I'd, I'd shockwave this to size, and then I would just line it with Supera and be pretty happy about myself. Here, I just said this was the universe telling me to stop, and, and so we stopped with that. You know, he had rest pain, that got better. Now he's got some inline flow to one tibial vessel. His wound started to heal. We put a cardium MEMS in him. Probably more than anything we did this day, his optimization of his heart failure therapy probably helped more and more. But um, just kind of a nice case. I mean, when we use atherectomy and we really work to use it appropriately, our goal is to avoid complications. You know, we're using it when we can't prep vessels. We're using it to avoid perforation. But it has its own risk of complications, including embolization, which we certainly saw in this case. Um, each of the devices have its own strengths and weaknesses, and they've improved as time has gone on. And, you know, thoughtful implementation and selection of those devices can really help you avoid some of these nightmares and, and goat ropes. So that's all I got. Thank you, guys. Peter, that was a, a great illustration of, you know, no one to walk away and no one to hold them, no one to fold them. Um, laser? Brush mark? Would you use that there? Or, I mean, I think once you get in the reflow once, I, I, I probably would have dropped Nikos, walked away, and came back the next day. I, you know, I, 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 yeah, I totally, right? And, and so, so laser is on that roster for dense calcium. I just, I, I, didn't, I didn't know how much plaque modification would really get with how dense it was. And so you, I, I went with the devil, you know, I know a little more. And I was kind of counting on the ability to cut some of that stuff out and then really placing a lot of faith in distal embolic protection just to get a lumen, but 100% totally reasonable, great idea. Wonderful. Listen, thank you so much, uh, Peter, for the sake of time. We're going to move on to the last presentation. Just want to remind everyone that we have our case competition at 1215 in Salon 8, not this room, two rooms down. And please come so you can you know, support the fellows that are competing. Uh, and uh, we have a, we're going to end with the best. End with the best. Oh, Dr. Thank you. Christopher Huff. We are completely changing gears here. <laughs> in fact, before it started, I actually cornered Mehdi and said, I think I'm in the wrong session. So we are going to move and talk about chronic venous disease, which is near and dear to my heart. He asked me to present a case I'm proud of. I'm proud of all of them. You know, they're really hard cases. And so anytime we're successful and I'm proud, it's like trying to pick your favorite kid. It may vary by day. Um, so this was a more recent one, which is why I chose to go with it. No relevant disclosures for this case. 
So this was a 42-year-old female um, who, in her 30s, had melanoma and underwent um, of her left lower extremity and underwent a lymph node resection where the CFA was damaged, requiring repair. About a year later, she developed an extensive left iliofemoral DVT. Um, this was this occurred at an outside hospital. She was managed medically. No intervention was performed. They did place a filter for very unclear reasons and then didn't track it, and it did not come out. She then presented to our office with ongoing years of severe post-thrombotic syndrome. She was not on anticoagulation. She was doing very poorly. Her Verlalta score was 22. She had some swelling of her right leg, too, but her left was worse, and it was bothering her a lot. We started with what most people would start with, which was a venous duplex. The venous duplex showed chronic thrombus in the uh, femoral vein, some in the common femoral vein. The iliac was poorly visualized, likely because it was occluded. Um, so from here, next step, CT venogram, right? You're going to want to figure out what's going on in that pelvis, since she did have a history of iliofemoral DVT. So this runs through quick, but you can see the filter is leaned against the wall. The hook is probably embedded in the wall. You have a functionally occluded common iliac, and you have severe external iliac vein disease bilaterally, as well as disease of the common femoral veins. So the challenge here to make this lady better, it was going to require extraction of a long indwelling filter, followed by cavoiliac reconstruction. And we plan to do that in stage procedures. You know, occasionally with complex filter extraction, it'll come out right away, and you can move into your um, you can move into your reconstruction after you get that filter out. But often it's pretty complex to get these filters out, and it's just a lot to do in one day, particularly if you're going to have to re uh, reconstruct the whole cavoiliac system. So this is IG approach, multipurpose catheter down past the filter. You can see the hook is probably embedded in the wall. The, the vena cava is severely diseased. We actually spent a lot of time trying to get a hold of this filter. Ultimately, I actually had to get access in the right common femoral vein. I had to work my way through what was a pretty diseased iliac vein to get another sheath in from below and actually push up on this filter to lean it off the wall just enough to pick away at it with these endobronchial forceps. Once I was able to grab it and get it within this 18 French cook sheath, I took the uh, interbronchial forceps out and put a snare in, sna uh, snared the hook, and then took a 16 laser sheath through the 18 cook and just lasered this filter out. Now what you're left with is a really, really diseased IVC with scarring and chronic thrombus, um, but we stuck with our plan. This took a while, and even though it's, it, it's difficult to walk away from this without doing something, we felt that we could wait at least a week before reconstruction and we kept her on anticoagulation, and she did okay. So she came back for the cavoiliac reconstruction, and if you heard my talk earlier this week, I am a huge fan of general anesthesia for these cases. These are long, these are difficult, they really hurt the patient because um, these veins are very diseased. So that was our plan, put the patient under general anesthesia, avoid discomfort. It's very nice to have two teams working on these cases, two docs and two techs, if you can have it, because it's a lot of work. And sometimes you end up working from above and below, and it's hard jumping back and forth, you know, for cases that may take several hours. Um, when you're getting, you're going to want often IJ and bilateral femoral access. If I'm convinced I'm going to cross from the femoral, I may not start with IJ access. It's important when you're getting femoral access to definitely access at the lesser troche because that, that's going to put you below the common femoral vein, below the insertion of the profunda. You're going to have running room to get your sheath in, and you're going to have full access to the common femoral vein which is going to be very diseased, and you're probably going to have to send all the way back to the insertion of that profundus. So you're going to need that room. So this is where you access. If you end up accessing above this, you may want to start over and get your access a little lower, okay, because you're going to need that running room. So I usually start with bilateral micro sheaths upsized to 8 French sheaths, and you end up going up to 10 uh, when you're going to stent, but just start with the 8. So this is the angiogram. Now, sometimes it takes several angles to figure out where the, you know, where the vein is supposed to be and the route you're supposed to wire. People describe it sometimes as railroad track-like appearance. You can see the robust um, ascending lumbar collaterals. Um, usually, the route is going to be just after those, and you can find the right, you can find the right angle, you can find the route, and you see it's, it's really this sort of small string-like structure that's extending beyond those ascending lumbars. 
On the right, I had already been up it, so I knew that side was going to be pretty easy to get up. So crossing, on the right side, it was straightforward, just a straight glide wire and a Navicross catheter, and we popped into the IVC pretty quickly. On the left, it was tricky, and we needed a little more support. Cook makes a catheter called the Triforce catheter, which is really just a forefront sheath with a CXI catheter inside it. It comes in 60 and 100 centimeters. They're different angles. But it offers you support as you're wiring up through the iliac. You can advance this behind you, and it helps you pop into the IVC, so it's very helpful. Once you get in the IVC, you need to confirm a couple things. Number one, you're in the lumen of the IVC, so a little puff of contrast will show you that. Number two, that you took the right route to get there. You want to make sure you, don't, you haven't crossed into a spinal collateral or some other crazy collateral. You know, if you look on the internet, you'll see all kinds of cases where people have deployed stents in spinal veins because they didn't know where they were when they deployed it. The way to fix that problem or avoid that problem is once you cross, just flip your x-ray lateral, and if your wire crosses anterior to the spine, then you're safe. And also IVUS before intervening, before balloon instanting IVUS. The iliac vein, or what's supposed to be the iliac vein, should follow the artery. So if you see that you're following the artery, you're probably right. And once you know that your wires are in the right spot, then you can be very aggressive about balloon dilatation. The reason some people fail at these is they're not aggressive. If they're not under general anesthesia, you're going to be hesitant to balloon aggressively because it hurts them a lot, so you end up with under, undersized stents in these clothes. So you need them asleep, balloon very aggressively, 12 to 14 to 16 uh, in the iliacs, 20 millimeter balloons in the IVC. I like to balloon on both wires to break up any webbing that may be there. It just gives you a better IVC stenting result. You can treat the IVC a number of ways. Um, I tend to like kissing stents extending down just below the renal veins into the iliacs, but you can do a 20 Aubrey stent and kiss down into your iliacs. You can, if the IVC is really big, you can use Z stents. Um, they all have pretty similar patency. So that's angioplasty. So this is our kissing stents that were just, uh, you know, the first thing you got to do here is make sure you're not crossing the renal veins if you don't have to, obviously. So you're going to IVIS, you're going to make sure your renal veins are in place, and you're going to put them both up next to each other. I tend to deploy simultaneously, maybe a little of one, a little of another. Um, I just tend to get better results that way without one riding higher than the other. You're going to post those. This, these were actually um, 14150 Abres ballooned with a 14. We had to extend with 14120, 12120. We post dilate everything. And here's your result. You can see we're just below the renal vein. The trickiest part tends to be on the back end, landing it in the healthiest portion of the common femoral vein. And that takes IVIS to figure out where that is and make sure you don't jail the profunda. So on the right side, you can see the dye exits very quickly. The collaterals are gone. And this is the distal left side or the caudal left side. And this is IVIS. And what you'll see in the IVC when you do kissing stents is a deformation of the stents. And they should be equivalent. One shouldn't be overpowering the other. And then you want to just look at your distal landing zone, make sure you land in a decent part of the vessel. And if we let this play through, you'll see that. The stents are wide open. and they both land in good spots. So, so post-procedure care, I tend to give them Lovenox in the lab, one mg per kg. Um, they got loaded with Plavix pre-procedure, so I continue them on 75. SCDs and leg elevation overnight to improve flow through those stents. Six hours of bed rest, pain control is very important. If you forget to order it, you will get a call. These are uncomfortable procedures. Home the following morning with adequate compression. I like to do low molecular weight heparin for two weeks before transitioning to orals. I just think it has an anti-inflammatory component, and these people are pretty inflamed after you work on them, tend to have better results with doing that. And then I prefer Plavix for three months and then Aspirin 81. At one month, she was doing great. Uh, swelling was significantly improved. Heaviness was improved. She actually also reported that she didn't realize how short of breath she was and how much better she felt after fixing this because we fixed her inflow to her heart. Uh, Velocity score improved dramatically. A duplex widely patent stents. Um, I usually do, like I said, clopidogrel for three months, anticoagulation indefinitely, and I follow these very closely on du with duplex. One month, three months, six months, a year. Any question about the patency of the stents, CT venogram or invasive angiogram. So the learning uh, points here is 
You know, when tackling complex IVC filter retrieval and reconstruction, consider doing stage procedures. Uh, general anesthesia is your friend, okay? Uh, IVIS will protect you and the patient from complications. Be aggressive with your stent sizing. Use vessel norms. You won't be able to size it by CT or ultrasound because they're so diseased. So just go by vessel norms. Uh, Clopidogrel for three months, long-term anticoagulation, surveillance imaging, CT if any questions. That's all I got. Appropriately, we finished with a very, very interesting, complex, and a beautiful case, Chris. Thank you so much. I just want to ask, maybe because of sake of time, Dan, do you have any questions or comments? Yeah, you didn't comment on this, but you sort of brought it up. Uh, on the duplex, you know, one of the things that I'm particularly looking for is patency of the deep femoral vein, because it's actually normally not the femoral vein that keeps these open. It's the deep femoral vein. And that's the reason you talked about where you're accessing Right. I'm accessing even further down the thigh because I want to be able to stent all the way to that confluence. Right. How do you judge where to put the top and bottom of the stent? And are you talking with your techs about give me deep femoral vein in, you know, information on the pre, pre-interventional ultrasound? Yeah, great point. You know, in my talk earlier this week, I took a lot of time to stress the importance of that. So the patients who you can't reconstruct are patients who don't have good inflow, and the most important inflow is the deep femoral vein. You should never jail it. In the venous system, it's just as important as it is in the arterial system. It's the lifeline of the leg. Sometimes, you know, we even extend stents into the deep femoral when there's no other place to land them that's healthy in the common femoral. So when I get an ultrasound, I, my tech knows to investigate the profunda vein. Um, access, like you said, is very important. You have to make sure you're beyond that insertion because you're almost always in these patients going to extend your stent right to the confluence where that is entering. So yes, that, that's very important. So you have a surgeon who does endovenectomy, you know, because I've done a couple of these patients where their proximal fem deep femoral vein is diseased. You can actually do a essentially an endovenectomy instead of an endo end arterectomy of that, and then use that as your inflow, usually that's combined with an arteriovenous fistula too. Uh, we don't have someone who can do that. I know it's done, I know it, you, it yields good results, but we don't have it. And it may be a, a good thing to have a surgeon like you if we have those cases that we end up turning down because we don't have good inflow. You asked me how I know where to land my distal stent. So usually, I mean, by IVIS, I can see where the profundus is coming in, but another nice trick is just to inflate a balloon um, in the, just above the distal external iliac or in the common femoral, inject some dye in your sheath, and you'll see reflux down the profundus. You know exactly where it is. Thank you uh, very much. I want to just thank all of our panelists uh, and uh, the audience. You know, it's been a fantastic CVI, and we have learned so much. I have learned so much. Uh, we're looking forward to next year. More